Good afternoon, everybody, and welcome to the third session of this um, very important, um, highly informative symposium. Uh, this session is dedicated to epidemiology and clinical manifestations of uh, SARS-CoV-2 infection and MIC in children. My name is Regino D'Arangelo. I'm the chief of the Laboratory of Clinical Immunology and Microbiology at NIAID. We have four outstanding speakers in this session, uh, which actually we span uh, a variety of themes, uh, ranging from health disparities uh, in uh, uh, SARS-CoV-2 infection. We heard earlier this morning from Dr. Newman and from Dr. Fauci how, in fact, there are ra racial and ethnic disparities in this disease. Um, so that will be addressed in greater detail now. Uh, we also heard about uh, the um, uh, heterogeneity in the clinical manifestations of SARS-CoV-2 infection, both in adults and in children, and how important it is to maintain uh, physical distancing, as Dr. Fashi recommended. But at the same time, it is, of course, very important to um, maintain attention to uh, education of our children. And so how to reopen schools is very important. And so how to do that in a safe manner will be the focus of the second talk. Uh, MIC and post SARS-CoV-2 monitoring has become now a focus of many studies, and we'll hear about that. Uh, and we also need to know more about what happens long-term uh, to adult individuals who actually get infected with SARS-CoV-2 and continue to manifest um, sometimes um, unexpectedly uh, some uh, symptoms of the disease long-term after the primary infection. So these are the main four themes. And let me introduce the first speaker, uh, Dr. Um, Akila Jefferson Shah, who is assistant professor at the Allergy Immunology Section, University of Arkansas for Medical Sciences. Dr. Shah. Hi, thank you for, for having me. Let me share my screen here. Okay, so um, today I'm going to talk about uh, health disparities in SARS-CoV-2 infection, and thank you all for having me. We're going to talk about structures and social determinants, so I don't have any uh, conflicts to disclose. The objectives for today's talk are first to define health disparities, uh, SARS-CoV-2 specific health disparities, assess the influence of social determinants of health on SARS-CoV-2, I'm then going to discuss a case study of New Orleans, Louisiana, um, gain an understanding of race and racism, and explore how to dismantle and restructure. So uh, health and healthcare disparities are defined by different groups in different ways, but overall relate to the differences in health outcomes among specific groups. The CDC defines health disparities as differences in health outcomes between groups that reflect social inequalities and preventable differences in the burden of disease, injury, violence, or opportunities to achieve optimal health that are experienced by socially disadvantaged populations. So there's a difference between health disparity and health equity. Disparity really is the difference, while equity focuses on justice, fairness, and making things right. Health equity is the state in which everyone has the opportunity to gain full health potential and no one is disadvantaged to attain full health potential, or no one is disadvantaged to achieve this potential because of social position or any other socially defined um, circumstances. So there is a difference also between equity and equality. Equity should not be confused with equality as equality refers to giving everyone the same supply while equity really refers to giving everyone the supplies that they need. And some people call this leveling the field. So, you know, this really, this topic is near and dear to me. Um, when the pandemic took hold of the U.S., so many of my personal family members and friends were impacted, and I and many others started to pay very close attention to SARS-CoV-2-related health disparities, and specifically racial health disparities. I wrote my observations in an op-ed for the Huffington Post entitled, COVID-19 has devastated the Black community. Here's why and what needs to change. So let's take a look at some of these specifics. This data from the APM Research Lab shows cumulative COVID-19 mortality rates per 100,000 by race and ethnicity from April to August. Black Americans continue to experience the highest actual COVID-19 mortality rates nationwide. According to the APM Research Lab, 
if people of color had died of COVID-19 at the same actual rate as white Americans, about 20,000 black, 10,000 Latino, 700 indigenous, and 80 Pacific Islander Americans would still be alive today. The CDC data shows that there's not only a difference in mortality, but also the burden of COVID-19 in communities of color. Overall, Black, Latinx, and Indigenous communities bear disproportionate COVID-19 cases and hospitalizations in addition to deaths, with cases more than twice as high in these groups and hospitalizations more than four times as high. Further, the APM Research Lab has age-adjusted race and ethnicity data to account for varying age distributions of America's racial and ethnic groups. After age adjustment, the gap in overall mortality rates actually widens between all other groups and whites who have the lowest mortality rate. To add to the sobering data, Black and Latinx people, when compared to white people, are more likely to know someone who's contracted COVID-19, to know someone who has died from COVID-19, and moreover, some communities of color are also more worried about contracting SARS-CoV-2, according to representative surveys. Unsurprisingly, these disparate outcomes by race are also seen among children. COVID-19 deaths among children are overwhelmingly among children of color. Recent CDC reports of pediatric deaths from COVID-19 from February to July in the US show that of the 121 people under 21 who died of COVID-19 complications, 45% were Latinx, 29% were Black, 14% were White, 4% were American Indian or Alaska Native, while Latinx children only make up 26% of the child population, Black children 14%, White children 50%, and American Indian or Alaska Native only 1%. Of note, 75% of fatal cases were among those with existing medical conditions, similar to what has been reported in adults. So briefly, let's investigate a case study of SARS-CoV-2 and health disparities. New Orleans, my hometown, was an early hotspot in the pandemic. After the first case was reported in March, within three months, the number of cases skyrocketed to 40,000 in the state and just over 7,000 in the city. The severity of the pandemic in New Orleans was initially thought to be related to long-term care facilities and recent Mardi Gras festivities. By June 5th, in New Orleans, Blacks accounted for 77% of the 492 COVID-19 deaths, while Whites accounted for less than 20%. The population of New Orleans is 60% Black and 35% White. If residents of long-term care facilities are factored out, nearly 88% of COVID-19 deaths are among Black New Orleanians, representing an even more stark racial disparity in SARS-CoV-2 mortality. When comparing New Orleans to other early hotspots in the pandemic, New Orleanians have higher rates of comorbid conditions, including high blood pressure, diabetes, coronary artery disease, chronic kidney disease, these likely increase the likelihood of severe outcomes for people who do get infected with SARS-CoV-2. Initial conversations around SARS-CoV-2 health disparities focused on underlying health conditions and personal responsibility. This is important, but resulted in unfairly blaming groups of people for becoming ill without a focus on why these underlying conditions may be more prevalent in some populations and other reasons why some communities may be at higher risk for contracting SARS-CoV-2 than others. In short, social dynamics, including the nature of one's work, like being a frontline or essential worker in retail, transportation, food packing, or health and social assistance, the privilege of social distancing and options to telework, having paid sick leave and safe working conditions, limited access to transportation and location of SARS-CoV-2 test centers, living in close quarters or multi-generational housing, bias in medical care, insurance status, and socioeconomic status. These are all social determinants of health. These are the conditions in which people are born, grow, live, work, and age. <clears throat> 
They include factors like economic stability, neighborhood and physical environment, education, employment, and social support networks, as well, of course, as access to healthcare. In New Orleans and in many other parts of the country, understanding the racial and economic makeup of the city is essential for clarity about who is most likely to be affected by social determinants of health and who is vulnerable to crises. In New Orleans, Black residents have lower median household income, higher poverty rates, and higher liquid asset poverty rates compared to other race and ethnicity groups. When compared to other early hotspots, New Orleans residents as a whole have lower median household income and higher poverty rates. Studies have shown that social determinants of health drive 80% of health outcomes, regardless of age, race, or ethnicity, while 20% of a person's health and well being is related to access and quality of services. So, is this by chance or a consequence of structures and policies? These impacts have been described in other parts of the US before the pandemic and in light of the pandemic. In Chicago, the study measured the social vulnerability index, which refers to potentially negative effects of social factors like socioeconomic status and housing type and overlay the social vulnerability map of Chicago onto COVID-19 deaths by race, health risk factors, and percent African-American population. They found that greater social vulnerability is associated with areas with more health risk factors, more African-Americans, and more COVID-19 deaths. A similar story has been illustrated in children. In Washington, DC, the study looked at SARS-CoV-2 infection in children and associated uh, in associations with race and ethnicity and median family income. They found that people of color and socioeconomically disadvantaged children carry the highest burden of infection. So what is happening here? A Gardner's Tale by Kamara Jones provides a useful explanation. She uses an allegory about a gardener with two flower boxes, one with rich fertile soil and the other with poor rocky soil. The gardener plants red flower seeds in the rich soil because she prefers red and plants pink flower seeds in the poor soil. Not surprisingly, the red flowers flourish while the pink ones struggle. Year after year, the same cycle continues and at some point later, the gardener returns to her gardener, garden. She says that she was right to prefer red over pink without note of the conditions in which she made the pink flowers live and try to survive. The Gardner's Tale highlights the need to understand and study social determinants and racism on different levels to help generate new hypotheses about the causes of race-related differences in health outcomes, as well as suggest approaches for developing effective interventions to eliminate those differences. So a few definitions. First, race is a social construct that divides people into groups based on certain characteristics such as physical appearance, particularly skin color, ancestral heritage, cultural affiliation, cultural history, and ethnic classification. Racism is racial prejudice often rooted in unfounded beliefs and irrational fear combined with institutional power. Structural or systemic or institutional racism is the overarching system of racial bias across institutions and society. These systems result in disadvantages to people of color and privileges to others. So now if we return to a Gardner's tale, Jones describes three types of racism, personally mediated or individual racism, internalized and institutionalized. Institutionalized racism also causes systemic or structural, manifests in both material conditions and in access to power. It is built on initial historical insults, maintained by structural barriers, and often hard to see. Arguably, in the US, the cultural narrative about racism typically focuses on individual racism and fails to recognize institutional racism. It includes differential access to quality education, safe housing, gainful employment, clean and safe environments, good medical care, and much more. So what does race and racism have to do with all of this? 
Well, race is used as a proxy oftentimes for socioeconomic status, culture, and genetics, but it is none of these. However, it does capture the social classifications of people in racialized society. These racial classifications have real life consequences, and although race is a social construct, it can capture the impacts of racism. That is to say that many of these race associated differences in health outcomes are in fact due to underlying racism. So what is the best way to assess what's happening here? How can race associated differences in health outcomes and racism be approached? First, the focus must be shifted to upstream variables impacting health outcomes, including systemic racism. The World Health Organization's Social Determinants of Health conceptual framework provides a way to hone in on the different relevant variables, including socioeconomic and political context, socioeconomic position, material circumstances, the biomedical enterprise, and more. Interventions will need to be both short and long term. So the solutions require acknowledgement, followed by dismantling and restructuring. First, we must avoid conflating race with racism. Race and ethnicity without appropriate context has led to inaccurate, misleading, and stigmatizing conclusions. Next, we must avoid race neutrality and colorblindness. Now, this may appear antithetical to dismantling racism, but though race is a social construct and it is not biologic or genetic, it is innate to our social fabric and it has real world consequences. So how can our response be race neutral? As SARS-CoV-2 has shown us, racism is the risk factor, not race itself. Next is anti-racism. So anti-racism is in direct opposition to racism. It requires identifying, challenging, and dismantling current systems in favor of ones that intentionally prioritize anti-racism. Intentionality is key here, not by chance, but by design. Intentionality allows more accurate evaluation of racial dynamics influencing social constructs. It goes beyond diversity, equity, and inclusion. It also requires self-critique. This means an honest and critical look at ourselves, the systems we build and support, and the systems in which we live. As Ibram Kendi notes, to be an anti-racist is a radical choice in the face of history, requiring a radical reorientation of our consciousness. Next, following anti-racism is structural competency in medicine and beyond. Jonathan Metzl and Helena Hansen describe structural competency in the context of medical education. It is not cultural competency, which is more focused on individual interactions and understanding culture. Structural competency recognizes the structures that shape clinical interactions and require an understanding of the upstream systems at play. It also requires intentionality. Next, approaches to laws and policies to improve social determinants of health, including early education, environmental justice, fair housing, access, criminal justice reform, equal protections under the law, and of course, healthcare reform. These laws and policies should be based on evidence and promote equity. Next, inclusion of people of color in the biomedical enterprise. This includes clinical medicine and research from access to care to testing and treatment, also access to research, fair and equitable allocation of non-approved therapeutics outside of clinical trials, fair allocation of FDA approved therapeutics and vaccines, exclusion of people of color limits generalizability, scientific validity, social value and fairness. While there is a known history of underrepresentation of people of color in research, partly due to mistrust and history of victimization, there's also lots of data to suggest intentional exclusion in many cases through inadequate recruitment, bias and discriminatory views, and often people of color are just not invited to participate. And so this must be corrected. Lastly, a commitment to health disparities research with appropriate focus and funding. Studies show that this type of research is less likely to be funded and that underrepresented investigators of color are less likely to be funded. 
comprehensive research protocols and data collection plans to more accurately assess and disentangle social determinants of health, including impacts of racism on health outcomes must be developed. And investigators must integrate these measures into hypothesis generation and study design. In closing, health disparities during the COVID-19 pandemic and beyond require an intentional focus on social determinants of health and structural racism in order to adequately address not only disparate outcomes, but inequitable outcomes. Thank you. Thank you very much, Dr. Jefferson, for this very interesting presentation. I would just like to remind all attendees and panelists that they can uh, post their uh, questions in the Q&A box, and those will be addressed at the end of all presentations uh, of this session. So let, let's move to the next presentation. Um, that will be given uh, by Dr. Cooper. Dr. Cooper is Professor of Pediatrics and Chief of Pediatric Pulmonology uh, Division at the University of California at Irvine. And his, his talk will focus on the clinical spectrum of SARS-CoV-2 and in particular implications for school reopening uh, in K-12. K Dr. Cooper, please. Thank you. Uh, so we're gonna uh, spend a few minutes talking about the COVID-19 pandemic and how it is in particular affected uh, one of the most uh, troubling uh, and important aspects of um, the, the whole matrix of, of social functioning and the ability to, to reopen and to ultimately achieve, hopefully, uh, an end to the really serious parts of this pandemic, namely the reopening of schools. Uh, this is a quote that, <laughs> made its way actually to the New York Times a couple of months ago. Uh, the healthy reopening of schools is the most complex, biologically mysterious, economically profound, and unfortunately, politically charged health issue I've ever encountered since graduating from medical school 46 years ago. And that's how we used to look somehow, uh, graduated uh, from UC San Francisco back in 1974. And I mean this as someone who uh, was the founder of a pediatric intensive care unit and one of the first training programs in PEDS ICU and subsequently in my work clinically and taking care of many children with chronic diseases in my role as a pediatric pulmonologist. Well, why should uh, academic health centers care? Why should the community care? This is uh, from an Instagram of uh, one of the schools in um, a highly affected Latino population in our area of Orange County. Uh, this was very at the very beginning of the pandemic. It's from super scholar Ruben, and he wrote, hello to all my Madison School friends. I hope you are all doing well. I miss you all. Hope we see each other soon. Stay safe. So why should we care? Well, there is mounting evidence that school closures adversely affected health and learning of children and adolescents. Will children and our adolescents become infected and sick as they re-aggregate in schools? And this, of course, is one of the, the key questions which is as yet unanswered. What is the risk for school personnel? Obviously, if teachers and school personnel become infected, then schools cannot continue to function. Can K through 12 students spark outbreaks throughout the neighboring communities? And then how do factors such as socioeconomics, race, ethnicity, and special needs of our students, students with chronic diseases or students uh, on the autism spectrum or with developmental disabilities, how will they be affected as schools reopen? So we have to remember that this almost throughout the entire world, schools closed at the start of the pandemic. And this was based on relatively scant data from previous pandemics that had suggested that you needed to close the schools if you were going to stop the spread of the disease throughout the society. Interestingly, the American Academy of Pediatrics and the National Academy of Medicine and myself uh, recommend that somehow the schools restart, but to do so in a healthy way. And we'll talk about this in a moment. We do know that disease severity in school-aged children appears to be less than in adults. 
and, and this is really an important point because it suggests that there is a some biologically derived factor which is matura maturationally dependent that the children somehow deal from an immunological perspective differently than adults uh, with this particular virus. And we don't really know the mechanisms of this. Uh, and this is an area where a friend of mine who's a pediatric infectious disease said, we really won't understand this pandemic until we understand why it seems that children have a different pattern of disease manifestation. Now the early data that was based on analyses in Europe and Asia did not in general show severe school stimulated COVID outbreaks, but there have been outbreaks. And it's also important to remember that the schools in Europe and Asia in April, May, and June did not return to status quo. Uh, most countries implemented physical distancing and face covering, and about 40% of European parents refused to send their children back to school. It was not yet mandated in those countries in May and June. Uh, and so we really don't know exactly what the situation was. Uh, here is a picture from uh, Denmark uh, of how the, the schools dealt with the physical distancing. There's no question that there's an impact of school closures on learning and other aspects in K-12 students. Here's a list of some of them. There's interrupted learning, there's poor nutrition. We're beginning to see that there's weight gain and lack of access to physical activity. It's certainly interesting that obesity is one of the profound comorbidities throughout all age groups. Uh, and it's related possibly to the immunological consequences of being fit or being unfit. Uh, unintended strain on healthcare systems, rise in dropout rates, uh, and social isolation among the many things that we have been observing as a result of the school closures. Well, what will happen as schools reopen across the world? We don't really have all the answer. Uh, this is just a recent report from Belgium of their 8,400 schools. Only 16 had to close partially because of the coronavirus and really not because of coronavirus spread uh, from kids, but really uh, from community-based. Uh, schools are reopening all over. Here's a school reopening in, Zim in Zimbabwe from just two days ago. Uh, and when we think about the socioeconomic and racial disparities that exist in California, for example, although uh, schools throughout the state have been mandated to be closed, there was a waiver system where individual schools could uh, petition to be reopened. And we found, not surprisingly, that private schools dominated the approval process for reopening. And one of the private schools that we've dealt with, um, the school spent about a million dollars in the past four months to be ready to open. The public schools face a whole different set of um, problems that have made it much more difficult for them, at least in our state, to reopen. So what can we do as academic health center? We can sound the alarm. Uh, we were able to organize a group of experts from around the country uh, back in April, and we published this paper, Reopening Schools Safely, the case for collaboration, constructive disruption of pre-coronavirus 2019 expectations and creative solutions. I wanna point out that uh, Lisa Gay Woodford, who is the head of the CTSI at uh, Children's National, and I really organized this effort, and it really shows the value of the kind of leadership that the, the CTSA movement and individuals like Lisa, as a prominent physician scientist, can provide. And this article really outlined many of the challenges. Little did we know how political this would become and what a national issue it would. We did know that it was a critical issue and that the question of reopening the schools would be something that was very, very important. Academic health center scholars can assist school districts to evaluate the data. In the past several months, we've witnessed a tsunami of data, information, misinformation, truths and half-truths. And the schools have been coming to us, not that we necessarily have all the answer, but to help them decide what of the information is, is, needs to be acted upon. And here's some examples. Uh, schools have reopened globally with no problems, either for students or for the population as a whole. You'll remember a couple of months ago that the administration was simply saying, oh, there's no reason to worry. 
we can just restart the school. And they showed this chart from Norway, which showed COVID-19 cases. Here's where society closed. Here's where schools reopened. And they said, you see, there's no problem. But they ignored this data from another country where here's where society closed. Here's where schools reopened. And I'm not saying this is causally, causally related but the data are not in yet as to what the impact of schools reopening is going to be. And the school personnel are confronted with this kind of information. For example, in July from Science Daily, reporting on a, an article that was in pediatrics, children rarely transmit COVID-19. Doctors write in a new commentary and they wrote, schools can reopen in fall. And then a week later in the New York Times, quoting another study, older children spread the coronavirus just as much as adults. This was the Korean study, and they wrote, school reopenings will trigger more outbreaks. So we can help get through this tsunami of information. Uh, academic health centers, as we've done in our region, can assist individual schools to plan. And we formed a group in Orange County of the Academic Health Center, UC Irvine, Orange County Healthcare Agency, and school personnel. And we visited schools, and we helped individual schools put together their plans and it was this is a school in Santa Ana which is one of our lower socioeconomic predominantly Latinx neighborhoods and it meant so much to the school that our personnel came out and visited and this was put on the school Instagram. Uh, we can work together uh, to create a symptom algorithm for frontline school personnel uh, stimulated by folks from Washington University. This has just been published in the Journal of Pediatrics. We put together a community group and we put together a practical school algorithm, which is shown here. We have this in uh, Spanish and in English. Uh, this has been very, very popular among frontline school personnel. There are very few schools in our region that have school nurses. Uh, we're gonna try to collect the data and see what patterns emerge as schools reopen. This was developed by Dr. David Rosen at Washington University. And as I said, proving to be very, very useful. And it was vetted by school nurses, physicians, school personnel and public health scholars. We created a consultation service in Orange County, which is again an academic children's hospital of Orange County and public uh, agency partnership, where we have a, a, an easily accessible number for people to call, for schools to call when there are questions about how their plans are going, what they can expect, what to do, if individual children develop symptoms and the myriads of questions. And we also have created a bi-weekly Q&A with Orange County School Nurses, which is attended by 100 and, about 150 school nurses every other week. And we're able to cover many, many of the questions that are asked. We can also do research. And the gaps in knowledge, as I mentioned, are really remarkably large. Uh, this is a study that we got funded from the Orange County Healthcare Agency, from University of California in Irvine, and from Children's Hospital of Orange County. This study has two aims, and we want to measure SARS-CoV-2 transmission in students and personnel in selected schools as they reopen. We're cognizant of the fact that we really need to address some of the basic biological implications. Why, for example, is the pediatric disease different? This was a nice a figure that came from uh, the uh, American Journal of Physiology about a month ago, which talked about possible mechanisms looking at the differences between the pediatric lung, the different kinds of alveolar macrophages, for example, and function of epithelial and endothelial cells compared to the adult lungs, and why we might develop some theories as to how the, the disease is different. So we're gonna address that. And we have to look at the environment, the impact of socioeconomic status and race and ethnicity, which as our previous speaker so excellently pointed out, is uh, having a huge, huge impact on uh, the disease severity and the disease. One of the things that we thought was extremely important was, and often ignored, was how would we measure the fidelity of mitigation protocols employed by the schools? What works, what doesn't work? And it's one thing to say, yes, we're gonna encourage face mask wearing, but it's another thing to actually measure whether or not there was face masks worn correctly by the students and personnel. And so what we did was we took an, a, a system that was out there called SoPlay, System for Observing Play and Leisure Activity in Youth, close to my heart because my group studies uh, physical activity and exercise in children. We study many, many schools and 
and often the impact of socioeconomic status on uh, the ability of kids to engage in physical activity. And so we took this existing mechanism, which has been published numerously and been around to do direct observations in schools and in playgrounds, and we adapted it to COVID. And we added to the observational matrix uh, things like face mask wearing, physical distancing. We've done our first training, and this is going to be part of our study. Uh, we've worked with colleagues from Northern Arizona University and UC San Diego who are writing this up, and I think this will be extremely useful to the community. Well, today is the first day of our study. Um, our, our Data Safety Monitoring Board, of which again, Lisa Gay Woodford is a member, uh, said uh, we guys are, we were very brave uh, to do this. Um, and a lot of, there's a lot of challenges in trying to do a study like this. Uh, our partnership again between UC Irvine, Chop Children's and Orange County Healthcare Agency, we're gonna study the kids. This week, uh, we're uh, offering serology for those kids who are willing to give us a blood draw. And we are going to uh, re-study the kids again at the end of the semester. We anticipate that uh, most, if not all, of our schools will be open. Innovative and necessary research, we think. We have four public, we have four schools. One is a public school in Santa Ana where there had been a current surge, although our numbers are down. Uh, this was one of the cases where there were COVID orphans, where two parents unfortunately uh, succumbed to the disease. Uh, these are schools where about 90% of the kids are in the National Student Lunch Program. Second school is a, a charter school in Santa Ana, California. Again, the school which is uh, predominantly Latino and lower socioeconomic. Uh, the third school uh, is very interesting because it's a school that uh, reaches out to kids with developmental disorders and disabilities. And here the concept, of course, of physical distancing is an oxymoron. Uh, teachers and aides need to take care of uh, these kids in close proximity. And what do we do for those situations? And our fourth school is a private school in Newport Beach, which is a very uh, middle and upper middle class neighborhood in our region with a population of predominantly middle and upper middle class families. So the bottom line for all of us is that parents need to know the society needs to know that school must be a healthy place. And AHCs can play a role. We simply need to follow the ABCs, activate our researchers and scholars, build bridges of trust, team science, and continuous learning in our communities. And we need to collaborate across the nation's diverse communities if we're really going to ever end this. Um, my approach to this is to consider this as um, a uh, learning health system. And I know that that phrase is used uh, with great facility and perhaps overused, but uh, it, it's really the idea that it is no longer sufficient for communities that include academic health centers to view their end game as writing papers. Uh, I think all of us are now clear and particularly highlighted by the pandemic that we need to develop appropriate and rigorous data collection models. That data has to be integrated into whatever the problem is of interest, in this case, uh, reopening schools in as safe a, a way as we possibly can. And you've got this mantra of knowledge to practice, of practice to data, and data to knowledge. And to do this, you really need a collaboration among the community, the academic health centers, and the healthcare frontline workers. And the academic health centers can bring certain skills, such as ability to, to co collate data and present it in the most uh, up-to-date manner, and statistical consulting, and the uh, panels of experts, uh, as, I, uh, as I mentioned before. And it's only through this combination, I really believe that we're going to be able to address the problem of schools reopening in particular and in the pandemic uh, in general. Uh, I'll conclude with this uh, quote from Einstein. Uh, and this is, uh, I think, something, a lesson that we've all learned, which is as for the search for truth, which has been difficult to achieve, in this uh, COVID environment. 
I know from my own painful searching with its many blind alleys, how hard it is to take a reliable step, be it ever so small, towards the understanding of that which is truly significant. So thank you very much. And obviously it would be great to hear uh, your questions uh, when the question and answer period comes. Thank you very much, Dr. Cooper. Uh, the next talk will be given by Dr. De Biase, who is the chief of the Division of Pediatric Infectious Diseases at Children's National Hospital. She's also professor of pediatrics and microbiology, immunology and tropical medicine at GW University. Um, we heard before that actually, we still have to learn a lot about long-term outcome of um, SARS-CoV-2 infection. Uh, she will focus specifically on MIC and post-SARS-CoV-2 monitoring in children. Roberta. Thank you so much. So thanks so much for inviting me to be part of this um, seminar. I can get the slideshow. There we go. Um, so I'm going to focus on Miss C today, um, and I'm going to put this in the context of what we've seen at Children's National, but also what other major centers have now published. And this also will encompass what we've seen with primary COVID infection in children, because it's very important, particularly for audiences that have dealt primarily with adults, to understand that MISC is not the only severe manifestation of COVID in children. So the impact of COVID and SARS-CoV-2 on the pediatric and young adult population really was uh, very underappreciated from the initial reports out of China with uh, initial reports suggesting less than 2% of overall infections. This was later revised up to 12% in China. And in fact, when the virus first hit the US and affected our colleagues on the West Coast, they had a very similar um, experience and impression as to what had happened in China with essentially very few hospital admissions and only a handful of critically ill children. And I remember at this time in March, we were on lots of conference calls um, and there really were not a significant number of critically ill children uh, at all. However, when the virus then moved to Europe and then uh, as you know, the European strain was to the East Coast, we on the East Coast experienced really a completely different experience. And I'm talking about not only DC, but of course, New York, Philadelphia, and Boston. And we saw significant numbers of infections, hospitalizations, and even critically ill um, children with primary COVID infection, and then later the onset of the uh, ill children with uh, multi-system inflammatory disease. So if we look at this data from the American Academy of Pediatrics and the Children's Hospital Association, which is updated almost monthly, there have now been uh, almost 650,000 cumulative uh, infections in children, and this is across all 49 states and the territories reporting. But um, if we look at all lab confirmed tests, children only are 10 and percent of all these. However, we know that children are really under tested. And if we look at all tests, it's really only four to 16% of all tests that are done in the pediatric population. If we then look at hospitalizations, there have now been almost five, or excuse me, over 5,000 hospitalizations in the United States. And this, of course, is a much lower hospitalization rate than in adults and the elderly. Um, <clears throat> and in fact, uh, less than 5% of all hospitalizations occur in the, in the pediatric population. And if we take any one child who is infected, uh, only up to 8% will result in hospitalization, and the vast majority are less than 1%. Um, mortality overall, there have been 109 pediatric COVID deaths, and this is, um, makes the point again that this is not a large number, but it is not insignificant, and in fact is very similar to what we see with our uh, annual deaths with influenza. So at Children's National, we've now had almost 800 symptomatic children come to our hospital for care. We've had additional children who are asymptomatic that are identified from screening and uh, operative procedures and admission to the hospital. But of these eight, nearly 800 symptomatic patients, approximately a quarter of them have been ill enough to be hospitalized. Um, and of those that are hospitalized, approximately a third are sick enough that they need critical care support. And at the peak of our uh, circulation in March, we had up to 17 of these pediatric patients in the hospital in our daily census. And this has come down um, as it has in the United States uh, in two different waves, but we're now down to um, two to three patients per day in the hospital with active primary COVID disease. Now, Miss C became a problem uh, towards the end of April, and I'll review that again. One of the other speakers went through the timeline in an earlier talk. But since uh, the emergence of this at the end of April, we've now had almost 130 children that clinically fit the uh, description, both laboratory and clinically, for possible Miss C. 
But then when we apply our clinical um, assessment, um, we can find alternative diagnoses in about half of those. So currently we have 63 that we feel meet the CDC case definition and have no alternative diagnosis. And of these, about half of them have been critically ill and needed support in the PICU, the other half in our special isolation unit. And again, similar to what I said for the census, we've had a peak of 12 a day at the height of this, and we're now down to zero to one of these children. Now, I want to highlight before I go on to Ms. C that uh, we, we reported this in Journal of Pediatrics in, in May, and this was really one of the first reports from a center that made the point that disease could be severe in children. Up to this point, the really the party line was that children didn't get sick and that we didn't need to worry too much about hospitalization at all. And in this study, which I'm not going to spend a lot of time on, we looked carefully at comparisons of the cohorts of children that were hospitalized or non-hospitalized and those that were critically ill and not critically ill. And it was clear from this study, even with our first 180 patients, that all age groups were affected. There was no um, group that was not affected in either of these uh, cohorts, but we did see an overrepresentation of critically ill children in the older uh, over 15 years of age age group. And, and the median age in that critically ill group was higher at 17 than in the other overall age groups, which was about nine. And underlying medical conditions were overrepresented in the hospitalized group in 60% compared to 40% in the overall cohort and 30% in the non-hospitalized cohort. This is an important paper that Dr. Song from our um, infection, who is our head of our infection con control division, as well as other colleagues in the laboratory put together. And this was a head-to-head -head comparison, again, the first that's been done in the pediatric population, comparing 315 COVID positive patients with 1400 seasonal flu patients who have been cared for at Children's over the same period of time. And the key finding here is that there really are no differences when we look at the effect on hospitalization rates, admission to ICU, mechanical ventilation, underlying diagnoses or even incidents of cough shortness of breath when we compare COVID to seasonal influenza. The differences we did see is that the COVID children are an older group, so median of eight years versus four years of age, and they had more symptoms, uh, symptomatology than flu with regard to fever, diarrhea, headache, myalgia, and chest pain. So with that as the background, I want to move now on to multisystem inflammatory disease because this is what I've been asked to talk about and focus on. And as other uh, folks have reviewed, there are many case definitions, but this is the CDC case definition. So this has to be a child less than 21 years of age with fever and lab evidence of inflammation by a variety of markers and clinically severe enough illness requiring hospitalization with at least two organ systems involved. They then must have either lab confirmation, either by PCR, serology, or antigen test, or a history of a direct contact uh, within the four weeks prior to the onset of their MIS-C symptoms. And then, of course, no alternative diagnosis. But what I'd like to point out, and I'll, I'll highlight this as we go through um, some of the other data, is that this is not a homogeneous group. So there is a group of children with MIS-C that initially emerged that were looked identical nearly to patients with Kawasaki disease or Kawasaki shock. But it became very clear to us in our patient population and in other groups now that there are um, equal numbers of, of patients, maybe even more, that do not have a Kawasaki phenotype uh, and have more of, a, for instance, a severe abdominal pain phenotype or a phenotype that is much more nonspecific without either uh, pro predominance of abdominal pain or Kawasaki. So this is a summary I put together that is just a timeline of what everything we basically, the experience we have had with MIS-C. And as you know, in late April in the UK, this was this initial cluster of eight children with a hyperinflammatory syndrome that really did look like Kawasaki disease or toxic shock. And, and the National Health Service in the UK issued a health alert. And I actually remember the day I was uh, taking care of patients and we, we received this and many of my colleagues across the country that are in Kawasaki networks were trying to discern if this was, you know, something that we had missed or that we, you know, might see soon. And sure enough, the next day, um, everything that had happened over in Europe uh, started happening in the United States really within a matter of days. So they released their case definition uh, at the end of April. By a few days later, there was a joint statement to the media after the Pediatric Intensive Care International Collaborative Call. And then a few weeks later, the CDC case definition was uh, released with the renaming of this to Multisystem Inflammatory Syndrome of Children. And then since that time, we now have had several case uh, series coming out of Europe. So UK Birmingham published 18 cases. Italy uh, had 10 cases carefully comparing KD to MIS-C. 
France and Switzerland, 35 cases. And then later, the single center US reports started being published. So a small number out of CHOP uh, with six patients in, uh, in late May, Colombia with 44, a, 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 a combination of patients um, totaling 33 from Montefiore, Einstein, and Jacoby, and then a large cohort of 33 out of Cohen Children's on Long Island. And I'm not going to go over all the details of those, but I am going to focus now on uh, the multi-center data that then came out in June and July, and there are three main ones I'll focus on. So one is the CDC data uh, that was published in MMWR and is now continually updated on the CDC website. Uh, Dr. Feldstein's study out of New England Journal, which was a conglomeration of multiple centers in the U.S., uh, totaling 186 MISC patients, and then Whitaker, um, which was eight centers in the U.K. with 86 MISC patients. So um, this is now looking at the MMWR data. So um, up to date, there have now been 935 uh, MISC cases and 19 deaths. This is across 42 states, and you can see the darkest colors are the ones with over 30 cases. So uh, definitely the East Coast, Texas, Florida, California, and um, Arizona are the highlighted uh, cases there. The median age is this five to nine year age group, but it does occur in many uh, different age distributions. And as is mentioned um, in many other talks, very much overrepresented in Hispanic uh, or Latino groups and our non-Hispanic black populations. There uh, may be a slight predominance of male versus female, but in almost every study, including ours, it's just a very slight predominance for males. Um, this is also a nice graph that shows what we all experienced that it, with that explosion of MISC cases really at the end of April and the beginning of May with this peak of almost 15 a day, which was exactly what we saw at our hospital, and then uh, coming down to a plateau and now uh, things dropping off again. But we would expect if a second wave comes that we would see a similar pattern in the, uh, as the antibodies develop in these patients that are infected in a second wave. This is the Feldstein study that was published in New England Journal at the end of June, and this is 186 MISC patients from a variety of states uh, the median age, again, was eight, and again, slight male predominance. Most of these children are healthy. This has been borne out in almost every study, whether single center or uh, combined. That is opposed to our primary COVID patients who are overrepresented by underlying diagnoses. These children are overrepresented by being healthy. Um, and these systems that are most involved have included the gastrointestinal tract and the cardiovascular system, as well as the hematologic and mucocutaneous systems. The median length of stay in this uh, study was seven days, and 80% of these patients at the time these patients were seen required intensive care, with over half requiring vasoactive support and 20% requiring mechanical ventilation. But what, what I will interject here is that with all new diseases, we do appreciate milder forms of the disease, and later published studies, including our experience, have shown that uh, it is not 80% of the patients that uh, require intensive care, and that's likely the very tip of the iceberg of these MISC patients. 2% um, death in this series and coronary artery aneurysms or uh, defined disease scores over 2.5 were seen in 8%. This has been higher in other series, including ours, which I'll get to in a moment. And Kawasaki, as I said, was present in 40%, but that means conversely that 60% did not have a Kawasaki type phenotype and yet still uh, met the MISC. Um, case definition. The use of immunomodulatory therapies, of course, is very common and appropriate uh, with the majority of children getting IVIG and aspirin, a, a smaller number getting either steroid interleukin-6 or uh, IL-1 receptor uh, in inhibitors. And this is a nice graph uh, from that patient from that paper that shows that the uh, as the percentage of patients testing positive peaked, there was a nice lag uh, approximately three to four weeks later with this peak of MISC cases. And we have seen this at our institution now twice uh, with regard to the census of patients that come in with MISC. So the next question as a clinician is how do I tell MISC from Kawasaki disease or Kawasaki uh, disease with shock syndrome or toxic shock syndrome? or for that matter, other infectious diseases, because as I mentioned, at least half of the patients that have been admitted do have a clear alternative diagnosis, but it's much harder to tell these MISC patients from a standard Kawasaki disease or Kawasaki shock patient 
clinically. So this was a study uh, published by Whitaker, which was 58 children uh, out of eight combined UK hospitals. And they um, tried to compare the features, the lab parameters, um, and the myocardial um, phenotype of these three different groups of patients. And what they found were that the MISI patients tended to be older with a median of nine years of age versus the younger Kawasaki patients at three years of age and the shock patients at four years of age. The MISI patients had much greater elevation of their inflammatory markers, although they all had elevation, and specifically with CRP neutrophil counts, uh, ferritin and fibrinogen, and tended to have lower lymphocyte counts and platelet counts. Most importantly, these patients had a higher incidence of myocardial depression, depression or ischemia as marked by troponins and uh, BNP. And then more recently uh, in the Journal of Clinical Investigation, also trying to get it teasing out, how do we tell these patients apart? And are there biomarkers that can discern between these clinical syndromes that look very similar uh, coming into the ER or coming into the hospital? Um, this is Diario uh, who published in the Journal of Clinical Investigation recently. They took 20 SARS-CoV-2 positive patients who were hospitalized and they compared nine with severe primary COVID-19 infection five with mild COVID-19 infection, and six with MIS-C. And these are all pediatric patients. They looked at cytokine profiles, the cycle uh, times for uh, viral PCR. They looked at blood smears and soluble C5 to 9 values. And they analyzed this with the clinical data. And they did find that TNF-alpha and IL-10 could discriminate between the patients with MIS-C and severe primary COVID-19 and also historically could discriminate between those with Kawasaki, standard Kawasaki disease. And the other speaker also mentioned, uh, this came out of her center, that uh, the PCR cycle times were also differentiating between these patients with severe COVID-19 and those with MIS-C, with higher cycle times for those with MIS-C, indicating a clearance of virus, and then a higher incidence of these uh, burst cells on blood smears in the MIS-C population. So with that as background, I want to now tell you a little about, uh, our, about our experience to date. Um, and this says as of June 8th, but that's actually as of September 28th. So we've had 129 admitted and evaluated, 63 clinically compatible. They range from four months to 18 years of age. And as you can see, about a half have been critically ill and half uh, have not. And I want to show, uh, give you a case um, presentation for the two main phenotypes that we see. So this is a patient who has these, the uh, classic Kawasaki type phenotype with shock. And this is a four-year-old male, completely well, no underlying medical history. He had a, really all the features of complete Kawasaki, including the five days of high fever, the rash, the mucous membrane changes, including strawberry tongue, cervical lymphadenopathy, and peripheral extremity changes. He came in the door with hypotensive shock and really had had no respiratory symptoms whatsoever, and this is very typical, and had markedly decreased myocardial function consistent with myocardial injury coming in the door. And this is really unlike what we see with Kawasaki disease usually. This child had very elevated BMPs. Um, the troponin peaked at 0.32. The echo in this child did not show coronary involvement. And after treatment with IVIG aspirin and anakinra, which is our uh, institutional path, which I'll talk about in a moment, um, that he did have good response and uh, resolution of his depressed myocardial function and repeat echocardiograms did not show any development of coronary involvement. The second phenotype is the one I told you about, but a second most common that does not have the Kawasaki presentation and tends to come in with just very severe and progressive abdominal pain, and then uh, can go on to hypotension and shock. So this is an eight-year-old, also completely well child, no underlying medical conditions. Five days prior to coming in, had had a, a little bit of fever, sore throat, and cough. So this child did have a little bit of respiratory symptoms, which as I said, is not commonly seen in our MISC patients. Uh, but really, it was the abdominal pain that had uh, progression and brought them back to the ED. The child actually became hypotensive and went into shock in the emergency room, really had no, uh, none of the KD findings. And this child um, had no segmental changes on EKG, but had extremely elevated troponins up to 2.83, mildly elevated BNPs. The echo did show decreased LV function, but most importantly showed a very uh, moderately dilated right coronary artery. Uh, really at the beginning, um, and also a left uh, main coronary with a Z-score of 2.8. So this child, again, was on our pathway, uh, received IVIG, 
twice actually because of severity and aspirin as well as antikinra and improved. So I, this leads me to point out, I don't want you to read all the fine print here, but when a new disease comes out that is very severe, the last thing you want to do is have people scratching their heads about what should I do and who should I call. So we immediately, when these re, uh, reports and press releases came out um, out of the UK, formed a Children's National Multidisciplinary MIS-C committee, which is uh, populated by all the important uh, clinicians that would take care of these patients and make decisions about our management in a, in an, in a scenario that's evolving. So we're, you know, we're building the plane as it's flying. So we have infectious disease, critical care, hospitalists, emergency medicine, rheumatology, cardiology, hematology, uh, all the, all the main specialties. And uh, we rapidly came up with a, what we thought was a reasonable approach to these kids, taking into consideration what we already knew worked for Kawasaki children, since at least almost half of these children were acting that way, but also um, supplementing this with a standardized approach to the immunosuppression. And you'll, you'll read uh, other papers that most centers um, that, that are large, that have large numbers, rather than try a variety of things, um, tried a, a, a pretty standardized approach. So for instance, Long Island uh, used corticosteroid, Detroit tends to use infliximab, um, and our center used anakinra for a variety of reasons. Um, and we have this protocol and a, a standard MIS-C task force email that anyone in the hospital could send to us and identify right away a patient so that we would all be immediately consulted and uh, get recommendations out right away. So as of uh, September 20th, uh, this is a summary of the 61 patients we've had. The median age has been seven and a half with this age range I already mentioned to you. The vast majority do not have an underlying diagnosis and we have still have the slight male predominance, overrepresentation again by the black and Hispanic uh, race and ethnicity. If we look at our SARS-CoV-2 status, about 60% have demonstrable antibody, and in our critically ill cohort, that's up to 85% of the patients. We do have about a third that do have PCR positivity in conjunction with antibody positivity, but all of these patients have very high cycle times, uh, meaning low viral load as they're clearing the virus, and this fits with the pathophysiology that we think is uh, applicable in this disease. Uh, about one third of the patients have a known direct contact, but two thirds do not. If we then look at severity, I've already mentioned that half are critically ill and about half have the Kawasaki phenotype. Uh, but even those that have the Kawasaki phenotype do have uh, a significant number have abdominal pain on top of that, whether or not that is the sole presentation in half or with the Kawasaki symptoms in conjunction. About half have had hypotension and about a third have required inotropic support. And this is a breakdown for you of those children, as I mentioned on our pathway, everyone gets IVIG and aspirin, but about two thirds have uh, required anakinra beyond that. And then um, a very small percentage have required additional immunomodulation, usually with hydrocortisone, but other uh, agents with our rheumatology expertise. If we then look at a summary of the cardiac findings in our cohort to date, um, at, the, at the initial echocardiogram, we have abnormalities in 41% of, uh, of this cohort, which is a very large number. And this has been broken down uh, into coronary abnormalities, myocardial dysfunction, and pericardial effusion. And what I've done here uh, with the help of our excellent cardiologists who've taken this on, uh, Nita Krishnan and Ashra Parasha, um, we can look at a Venn diagram and see that of the 11 that had coronary abnormalities, or 18%, there's an overlap of those that have pure ectasia or Z scores from two to two and a half, but then others additional that have in conjunction with the coronary abnormality uh, concomitant myocardial dysfunction. So here, for instance, are two patients with frank aneurysm and myocardial dysfunction, or even patients that have all three, myocardial dysfunction with coronary abnormalities and pericardial effusion. And likewise, uh, are about a quarter have had myocardial dysfunction and 15% have had pericardial effusion. So I want to um, now focus a little bit on the knowledge gaps that remain both for uh, SARS-CoV-2 infection in general and MIS-C in particular, and I'm going to highlight a couple of areas where Children's is filling this gap. 
and working with NID in partnership to address these problems. So the first is infection and transmission in children. You know, we really have no idea what the overall seroprevalence is in children in all of these large seroprevalence studies. Um, have children in them, but none of them are purely in children. So that's a very key question. Um, it could be it's much higher or it's much lower in children. And that's, of course, very uh, important for community spread and decisions about going back to school. Um, we don't know for sure what percentage are asymptomatic versus symptomatic in children. We think it's similar to adults, but we don't know that for sure. Um, we've already talked about the racial and ethnic disparities, and our group uh, was the first to publish this in the pediatric population. So this is Monica Goyal's uh, work. Um, we're interested in the fetal maternal interface, and we're following uh, babies born to uh, COVID positive pregnancies for both neurodevelopmental outcomes as well as placental abnormalities. Um, we've been very interested in the kinetics of viral load shedding and antibody detection, and Dr. Bahar published this in the journal Pediatrics uh, that looked in our population at the kinetics of clearance and antibody production across the different age groups in our SARS-CoV-2 infected children. We're validating saliva-based point of care testing in our population because access to easy testing is very important for opening in the community as well as accessibility to all of our patient populations. And then um, what I want to talk about here now are two main areas, our interest in the mechanisms of MIS-C inflammatory state. So I'm going to talk a little bit about preliminary data in our viral genetics uh, in correlation with disease phenotype and severity. And then I'm also going to just show you one slide on some of our preliminary data with cytokine profiling. So this work with cytokine profiling is uh, put together by our division of rheumatology, including the attendings and the fellows, but led by Hemalopthus srinivasalu. And this this shows you here, um, we have three groups. We have MIS-C confirmed. We have those we call inconclusive, meaning we don't have lab confirmation, but they do have the appropriate exposure history. And then we have those who are that half that looked like they had it when they walked in the door, but had an alternative diagnosis. And as you can see, uh, we have IL-6 and IL-2 receptor overrepresented in our MIS-C confirmed and even slightly elevated in our inconclusive groups compared to those that it's ruled out. And likewise, these are pro-inflammatory, but we also have elevations of anti-inflammatory cytokines such as IL-10. And I'm only showing you three here just for visual purposes, but we're looking at this in a much more detailed uh, way. And then from the standpoint of the SARS-CoV-2 viral and host uh, uh, process. Um, our, our group is focusing on three different arms. So we're initially doing deep patient phenotyping to identify patient subgroups, as I've alluded to. They're not just all MIS-C or just all primary disease. And because we have a very detailed uh, clinical metadata, we're uniquely positioned to link these subphenotypes of patients to the viral genome variants that we, uh, that we identify. So secondly, um, we are sequencing SARS-CoV-2 viral genome to identify these unique mutations that could potentially be driving these different disease presentations. And then thirdly, we're utilizing the CNH um, clinical whole genome analysis systems to identify potentially rare variants in our pediatric population that could be driving disease. And this is all work from uh, Drew Michael, Megan Delaney, John Latempio, and Eric Villain in our divisions of lab medicine uh, and genetic medicine research. So um, we, what we first did is construct an approach that enabled us to rapidly classify each patient into clinical subphenotypes using a binary matrix of these phenotypes that we've described clinically. Then we used artificial intelligence to subgroup uh, these, um, these uh, subgroups uh, into uh, um, clusters. And then we can visualize these clusters and understand the distribution of these subphenotypes uh, within our cohort. So here, if we visualize the distribution of SARS-CoV-2 phenotypes in a 3D principal component analysis, you can see that we have five main clusters of patient presentations in children. And so we have, for instance, primary illness that are not critically ill, and then over here, primary illness that are critically ill that cluster closely with our MISC patients that are not critically ill and have a Kawasaki phenotype. And then over here, we have two other clusters, uh, critically ill MISC children either with a Kawasaki phenotype or those who do not have a Kawasaki phenotype. So this is useful. <clears throat> Uh, because once we um, have these phenotype subgroups established for each patient, we can start to link the phenotypes to the viral genomics. So here we're looking at a heat map 
of viral variants on the x-axis with patient outcomes color-coded on the right, on the, uh, on the bar on the right. And you can see that we have four uh, viral variants in all of our patients that's listed here in the pink here. These are all common to all of our patients. Uh, but you can also see that each of our patients has other unique uh, uh, collections of viral variants. And so now what we're trying to do is uh, understand the link between these viral mutations and the carefully characterized um, clusters of patient subphenotypes. Um, and then lastly, um, you know, in addition to linking the viral variants to disease outcome, we want to integrate our viral sequences into what's known in the global SARS-CoV-2 lineages spreading across the globe so that we can understand if unique strains of SARS-CoV-2 that infect our personal patient population could be relative to other locations. So, for instance, the CNH pediatric uh, SARS-CoV-2 cases seem to fall into the B1 lineage, which is associated with what was seen in the European outbreaks and makes sense because what we experienced was very similar to that. Um, and you can see that that's also what has been seen in other states such as Texas and Arizona, but not, for instance, in California or Washington or Seattle, which tend to have a different um, uh, viral um, uh, sequences that are circulating in that area. So all of this data will help us to understand which variants are enriched in our patients compared to the rest of the world, and we're trying to put all this together um, to see which are present in our particular population and put that in context of our MIS-C and severe COVID-19 phenotypes. So um, this is just a summary of what I just said. So lastly, uh, I wanted to just uh, mention the last known knowledge gaps and an exciting uh, partnership we are now uh, going forth with NIAD with. Um, we are working very hard on treatments. We have a convalescent plasma program in our hospital and we've used that uh, in some of our older and most sick uh, patients. Um, as you heard, Kath Bollard and Mike uh, uh, Keller are working on T-cell therapies and characterizing the T-cell epitopes in these patients. And of course, we'll, we'll be involved in clinical trials of therapeutics in this population. But the area that I'd like to uh, end on is that we really need to follow the short and long-term outcomes in both the primary COVID and the MIS-C population. And this relates to both pulmonary function, cardiac function, and coronary abnormalities, but most importantly in children, neurodevelopmental outcomes and quality of life outcomes. So this is a new partnership. Um, it's not a new partnership, but it's a new project of our partnership where we aim to study a thousand pediatric patients uh, from our center. And this encompasses both symptomatic and asymptomatic patients. We'll be enrolling both patients and household contacts. And this will be a natural history study, carefully looking at the outcomes I've uh, outlined there, as well as building a biorepository for all of the important uh, immunobiology and genomic studies that have been discussed by other investigators. And my partner on this project at NIID is Gina Montelegre, who's in uh, pediatric rheumatology. So we're very excited about this. Um, and I believe that's my last slide. So thank you. Thank you, Roberta. This was great. Uh, so the last talk of this session will be uh, given by Dr. Sneller, who is a senior investigator in the laboratory of immune regulation here at NIID. And he's going to talk about RECON 19, a longitudinal study of COVID 19 sequelae and immunity. Mayo. Okay, thank you. Um, so, I guess as most of you probably know, uh, there's been considerable interest of late in uh, emerging appreciation that a significant number of individuals who have apparently uh, recovered from the acute manifestations of COVID-19 continue to experience a variety of, of symptoms and abnormalities. Uh, to my knowledge, there are really no data from cohorts of, of recovered COVID-19 patients uh, who have undergone comprehensive standardized medical evaluations. Uh, and thus, there's really a paucity of data about what either the nature or the frequency of any post-COVID sequelae might be. Uh, so what I'm going to talk about here is basically the adult version of, of the trial that uh, Dr. DiBiase just described that they're getting ready to launch in, in children. Um, so this study is being conducted at the NIH Clinical Center. Uh, it's a longitudinal study of COVID-19 sequelae and immunity. Uh, and I'm the principal investigator, and I'll show you there's a number, we have a number of co-investigators who are also involved in the study that I'll, I'll list at the end of the talk. So when we first began, I think when thinking about how 
what the possible sequelae of COVID-19 might be, I think it's important to appreciate uh, probably something that's already been mentioned uh, is that the, really the wide spectrum of disease severity for the acute, the acute disease. Uh, this is a, a slide that summarizes the results from a study from China of over 40,000 uh, individuals with confirmed COVID-19. As you can see, the vast majority suffered mild to moderate disease. Uh, about 14% or so suffered what's termed severe disease, which in this case, I believe, was defined by the need for hospitalization and supplemental uh, oxygenation. And 5% had critical illness, again, defined by the need for admission to an intensive care unit and mechanical ventilation. So when thinking about the possible sequelae of, of COVID-19, uh, Lab, when we were doing, setting this up last spring, we, you know, we tried to figure out how this wide spectrum of disease severity might influence what we would see in patients who had recovered and what type of sequelae they might uh, develop. So if you think about just the 5% or so of people who would have critical COVID-19, maybe half of whom would not survive, but half of whom would, I think we expected that they would, we would see the known sequelae of, of ARDS or severe critical illness that can occur with a, n a number of um, severe infections and has been relatively well defined in the literature prior to the advent of COVID-19. And these include problems with uh, persistent abnormalities of pulmonary function, uh, impairment of cognitive processes and psychiatric disturbances, including uh, post-traumatic stress disorder, and decreased exercise endurance and physical disabilities. So we wanted to be sure to have these types of evaluations in place that allow us to assess these types of uh, sequelae. But when it comes to the majority of people, uh, who suffered either mild or non-critical COVID-19, of course, the majority of them will survive. So the vast majority of people we're likely to encounter would, would really have mild to moderate disease, and we really didn't know for sure what the sequelae of that might be. But, the, but in thinking about it, we thought it might be similar to sequelae that have been described with other sort of non-critically ill post-infectious syndromes. And a couple of examples of those are, are shown on the slide. So there's the post-viral chronic fatigue syndrome uh, and post-treatment Lyme disease syndrome. Now, both of these syndromes and some other syndromes uh, that are, again, seen in people who recovered from non-critically ill infections share a number of common symptoms, including fatigue, decreased exercise tolerance, palpitations, uh, myalgias, arthralgias, and sleep disturbance. So again, we wanted to, when planning our study, we wanted to make sure we had the resources and testing and expertise in place to address these types of symptoms, which we expected to counter, encounter uh, relatively frequently, and in fact, are encountering relatively frequently. So turning out of the study, the study objectives are fairly straightforward to characterize the medical and mental health sequelae following recovery of adults from COVID-19. There's also a piece involving looking at the evolution of both the T cell and B cell responses to the virus over time, which I won't be talking much about, uh, but that involves a number of laboratories here uh, on campus at, at NIH. So this is just a, this slide demonstrates sort of the general study outline. For the COVID-19 cohort, participants must have laboratory documented infection with SARS-CoV-2 and be at, le at least six weeks out from the onset of symptoms. Or if they're asympt they were asymptomatic, uh, four weeks out from their first positive uh, SARS-CoV-2 PCR. Now, given that sort of the multiple types of symptoms and medical problems that have been described so far in recovered COVID-19 patients, we felt that any attribution of these problems to COVID without a control group for you know, sort of a comparative analysis would be difficult. Hence, our study also includes uh, COVID or non-COVID negative controls. Uh, and they, both, both groups, both cohorts, the COVID recovered and the negative controls undergo the exact same evaluation in the study. So they come in for a baseline visit, which is, uh, is fairly intensive with regards to the studies that are done, which I'll show you in a second. And then we will continue to follow them uh, at least every six months for three years. So the baseline evaluation, again, which is done on both cohorts, includes a, a thorough his history and uh, physical examination. We do a variety of routine laboratory testings, including co coagulation parameters, measurements for cardiac injury, BNP troponins, and a full flow cytometry panel. Uh, we administer uh, sort of several questionnaires we're using to assess, assess functional status. Uh, we do SARS-CoV-2 serology using at least two, three or four uh, EIAs, as well as a neutralizing antibody assay. And we also obtain blood for research studies and storage and do this 
try to do this predominantly by uh, leukophoresis so we can obtain large numbers of cells again to be banked uh, for, and stored for future research on the immune response in these patients. So we also include in the baseline visit a comprehensive mental health evaluation, which includes a formal psychiatric interview by a, a clinical psychiatrist and mental health questionnaires and cognitive function testing. Uh, cardiac wise, we're doing EKGs, echocardiograms and cardiac MRIs on everyone. We do a full set of pulmonary function tests with a six, including a six minute walk test. And then we're, we really are allowed to do that in the protocol any other standard diagnostic testing or consultations needed to work up any symptoms or abnormal findings uh, that we may find. So follow-up visits, as I mentioned, occur every six months for three years. Most of the baseline studies and evaluations are repeated at either the six-month or 12-month follow-up visits. The one possible exception to that is the cardiac MRIs. At the present time, if, if an individual has a completely normal cardiac MRI, we aren't planning on repeating that at one year. Uh, during the, again, an additional aspect that we want to look at is during the follow-up phase, is that anyone, we've asked anyone in our COVID cohort, who, if they develop any sort of COVID-like symptoms, uh, you know, more than six months out from their acute infection, that they let us know and we'll you know, try to bring them in, test them to see if they have COVID-19. We'll also test for other respiratory, with a respiratory virus panel for other respiratory viruses to sort of get an idea of if reinfection occurs, uh, what, what clinically, what are the characteristics of that reinfection? And just to show you, so one piece of data, this is a, shows the sort of spectrum of initial disease severity in the first 50 participants that we've enrolled in this study. As you can see, it looks very much like the second or third slide I showed you from China in that it's almost the exact same proportions of patients that we've enrolled in our current study that have mild to moderate disease, severe disease, or critical disease. And finally, this is a list of the co-investigators. I won't go through all their names, but suffice it to say we have a number, we have expertise in, in clinical infectious disease, in laboratory immunology. We have colleagues in the NIMH, uh, as I mentioned, the clinical psych three clinical psychiatrists and a clinical psychologist and pulmonary and cardiovascular uh, investigators from NHLBI who help us with the pulmonary function testing and the cardiac studies that I've mentioned. And so that's really all. Looks like I finished ahead of time. Thank you very much, Dr. Tyler. Yes, you did finish ahead of time, which helps us with the questions. Um, we received a number of questions. I don't think we will have time to go through all of them, but they're all pretty interesting. So hopefully the um, speakers have also had a chance to look at them and those that I won't be able to go through, uh, they will be able to address maybe uh, in writing uh, you know, during the break. So um, let me start first of all uh, with questions that were asked to uh, Dr. Jefferson and there were uh, several of them. So um, one, one, one question was about um, not so much socioeconomical factors, but perhaps also genetic factors that may um, contribute uh, to a higher rate of severity in the black population uh, and the Hispanic population versus others. Uh, Dr. Jefferson, do you have any, um, any view on these? I don't see her, I don't. I think she left. She may have left, actually. Mm. All right, that's that's too bad because there were a number of interesting questions, like you know, um, use of PPEs uh, and uh, other adjusting for other comorbidities. How would that change uh, the outcome in the black population? And I had a question myself about medicine investing at this time, much on treatment and very little on prevention. And that might also contribute mm -hmm. diet and education uh, to this uh, unequal representation of severity among, um, you know, this population versus, uh, uh, yeah, doctor. Yeah, thank you, Lisa, if you can get her back, uh, we can go to the next questions meanwhile. Uh, and so let me move then to the questions for, um, for, uh, for Dr. Cooper. Uh, and so here. So uh, one question was about um, special measures that the school perhaps have to think about like air filtration. So what's the situation in California? What do you know 
in general about these measures? And if I'm add to that, um, what about school buses? So yeah, I'm, uh, I, I was hoping to avoid those questions because uh, <laughs> they're, they're, uh, they are critically important and relevant. But in my scanning as a uh, pediatrician, uh, pulmonologist and exercise scientist, it's above my pay grade. And I've looked into this, I've talked at, to a great extent with our environmental health scientists. But what I think we can conclude is that they are very, very relevant. But what do we actually know from rigorous studies about the, you know, the role of air filtration? You know there have been those studies from an occasional restaurant in China. I think everybody's familiar with that where you had patients, sit, uh, people sitting in a restaurant and there was an air conditioner and there was one, table one that had uh, somebody who was COVID positive and then three people in the adjacent table got it. Mm -hmm. So um, I, I think that one of the great gaps in knowledge is to try to better understand what the role of ventilation is. It clearly plays a role. We're lucky in California because at least in the in Southern and most parts of California, uh, uh, ventilation is not the same uh, conundrum as it is in uh, the Eastern schools where you have winter and you have profoundly older buildings with poor ventilation. Um, it, has, it has been an issue about the reopening of school waivers. Um, minimal standards are required, but I would argue that this is one of the big gaps in our knowledge is to understand and be able to tell a school what the safest level of ventilation is. And I may add, that in my own research and exercise, for example, which is an aerosolizing function, we haven't answered that question and it has great relevance about how do we do pulmonary functions going forward, how we do exercise testing in the hospital. So that's a non-answer, a long-winded non-answer to a really, really good question. Thank you. Another question, thank you for Dr. Jefferson, you're back. Um, let me finish first with Dr. Cooper and then we'll get back to you. Um, Dr. Cooper, there was another question about, um, you showed actually a slide contrasting the situation in Norway and Israel after reopening of the schools. But to stay with this country, one of the questions was about the rise in cases that have been seen in New York after opening of the schools. So at what point do you think um, we'll face a risk of closing again? And what would be your suggestion how to monitor the situation and when and how to intervene? Well, so, you know, very tricky question. Um, you saw the data from Belgium, which suggests that the few schools that had been closed were not uh, necessarily the result of kids spreading this to personnel, but rather viral acquired disease. Everybody on this panel, I'm sure, is familiar with the concept of the break room breakout. Um, I think we've all been involved now in studies at our various institutions that show that healthcare workers who pay attention to PPE do well even in COVID environments, except when they go sit in the break room, take off their PPF of coffee with each other. So it's a nuanced answer. And I don't know that there is a number, you know, is it 5% infectivity rate? Is it 10% positive? I don't know. I suspect we should avoid summarily closing public schools until it's really, really clear that the virus that we're seeing is coming from the students or that we have a, a source. And, and Dr. DeBiase really showed this elegant data about using um, molecular phylogeny to figure out where the virus is coming from. That's something we want to do. Um, so I, I think that, let me give you a general impression. In, in most societies, in most communities, people have said the criteria that allow you to open the school is going to be the general infectivity rate. So that's true in California, that's throughout all the country. Um, I would add to that that one of the criteria should be the quality of the particular school's plan to maintain a healthy place. You know, are they, do they have a plan in place that parents want to know at seven o'clock or eight o'clock in the morning when I bring my child to the school, is that school really ready to address the needs? I think parents understand that there is now in this day and age, no zero risk. The virus is there and it's going to be there. And we have to weigh the problems of keeping schools closed with the problems of keeping them open. I'm gonna end with one concept. So in Orange County in LA, we have 1.2 million K through 12 children. I'm not sure that having those kids roam around unsupervised because schools are closed is going to reduce the spread of this virus. We know that in the lower socioeconomic neighborhoods, for example, in our region, 
There are popping up all kinds of unsupervised daycare because people have to go to work. And we have no idea what's going on in those little daycare centers. We don't know if the kids are washing their hands. And in the upper socioeconomic neighborhoods, parents are hiring teachers from public schools to run these little pods and to do distance learning. And again, we don't know what's going on there. So um, my answer would be, this has got to be one of these learning health systems where you have community people, school people, um, health experts and parents and teachers get together and say, let's, let's not just reflexively close schools, but let's figure out a way to come up with reasonable numbers when and, when and if we should close schools. Okay, thank you very much. One last question to you and a question to Dr. Jefferson at the same time. From trading masks to wearing masks. So kids are kids, they do trade masks. Do you monitor that, Dr. Cooper, <laughs> in, your, in, in your situation? And Dr. Jefferson, has any study been done or are you involved in any study that looks actually at using masks uh, in the black community and Hispanic community? How stringent is actually compliance with you know, the five points that Dr. Fauci mentioned in, in his presentation? So, um, yes, we're going to observe that. I personally don't recommend training masks. <laughs> I would hope everybody agrees with this. Um, in Orange County, we have a unique situation where we have a board of education, which a couple of months ago uh, rather proudly said there is no problem. We should simply open schools and let everybody go back to school. And we, and, and we don't need masks and we don't need, and masks are, uh, make children sick and all this sort of stuff. And uh, the, the sad part of that is that when you go out to even younger children like Montessori and daycare and stuff, with good teaching, younger children really learn how to wear masks. They learn not to share their masks. They have fun with masks. There is another issue, of course, with kids with special needs. So this all can be done and it can be done without harming kids at all. Thank you. Dr. Jefferson? Yeah, so um, regarding the masks and or mask wearing and differences among racial and ethnic groups, as far as I'm aware, there are not any peer reviewed studies uh, so far looking at this, but there is some poll data that shows um, that among minority communities or people of color in the US at least, there is more use of masks um, when polled um, compared to um, white Americans. Um, there have also been some polls looking at kind of differences depending on where you live geographically um, with a kind of more uptake in places like the Northeast with what, uh, mask wearing versus the South and the Midwest. And then also, um, funny enough, among kind of a political orientation. So, you know, the, the data is, is sort of there in a way. Um, the other thing to note is that with mask wearing, there have also been lots of reports of discriminatory um, uh, issues um, among uh, racial and ethnic groups, um, people of color, when wearing masks. Um, so for instance, early on in the pandemic, among Asian Americans, lots of um, discrimination if they wore a mask in public um, versus other groups of people. So, you know, kind of being cognizant of that too, but despite those issues, Generally speaking, um, at least early on when these polls were done, it seemed as if uh, communities of color were indeed wearing masks um, at pretty decent rates. And then you, I think you very clearly presented the socioeconomical disparity that exists between uh, the white population, the black population, and how that has impacted on COVID-19. But one of the questions that you were asked actually um, had to do with possibly genetic factors. Um, what is your view on uh, non socioeconomical factors, but truly genetic factors may also contribute uh, to the different outcome of COVID-19 in these populations. Right, so I think, you know, we need to look at every single um, possible difference that's causing these, these differential outcomes, these disparate outcomes. Um, but I do wanna note that we have to be sure not to conflate race with genetics. Um, you know, we're thinking if we're, I saw the question was talking more about genetic expression or overexpression in certain populations. So I think what the question is about is, is uh, genetic ancestry. So which is not race, right? Race is a social construct and we have to be very clear, um, I think, and in, in intentional about parsing those things out. 
um, and not conflating the two. We do know that there are contextual factors in the environment and things like that among subgroups that may run along ancestral lines that um, where you can have either overexpression or underexpression of certain genes based on, uh, on the context. And so I think definitely we do need to look at that, but we have to be sure to note that that's not a racial difference. That is a genetic ancestry um, difference that has to do with, with gene expression and whatnot. Um, the other thing is, is that, you know, we also know that genetic variation within races is much more, um, there's more variation than across races. So just to, to drive home the point again, that race is social, it's not genetic. Though we do, you know, we should look at every reason, including underlying gene expression, um, with regards to why certain groups are differentially impacted by a SARS-CoV-2 infection. Thank you very much. Roberta, a couple of questions for you about um, IL-1 inhibition. And in particular, um, is there any correlation between uh, um, IL-1 receptor antagonist therapy and the actual levels of IL-1 receptor antagonist in blood? And for how long do you use an akinra in the patient population since it's part of your protocol? Yeah, that's a great question. So because this data, this preliminary data is not from a research protocol, but from clinical care, the timing of the cytokines that have been drawn, the panels, are not always pre anakinra and some are post. So that's going to be a, a larger part of the analysis, like what percentage are this or that or the other. But just taking it as a whole, there's this difference that we see. Uh, but that's definitely very important. Um, the point about anakinra, and this we're really interested in this. The reason our rheumatologists um, focus on anakinra is we have a, a long track history of using this in other um, inflammatory dysregulated disorders in children, and it has a very good safety profile, particularly if uh, when this first emerged and there was concern about these people being PCR positive and um, you know, having the least effect on global um, immune suppression. Um, and then also it's very titratable. So that, that is a good part, part of it, but the bad side of it is that it has to be weaned. So our, we're very interested in looking now at our length of stay compared to patients and centers that, for instance, just got a blast of steroid and then you know, got better and went home in seven days. So um, there's quite a wide range, um, but most of the patients that got up to you know, eight per kilo of anakinra then have to come down. Um, so they can be in the hospital as long as two weeks, some of the patients, um, but some are out in a week. Um, but we'll be looking carefully at that. For length. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you. Another question was about patients that are not sick enough to be hospitalized, but they look like MSC patients. So do you have a plan to follow them up and how do you follow them up? Yeah. So I totally, I only told you about the ones that met the criteria that they were sick enough to come in. And then I told you that half of those that were sick enough to come in ultimately had a different diagnosis. But what I didn't tell you is that there's yet another probably 200 kids that did look, if they were sick enough, they would have also met this loose criteria. So our ED group is doing a separate analysis of all those kids. And we're gonna see if anything falls out of predicting, you know, did they really have a milder form of MISC or not? And then for all the kids that actually came in the hospital and got admitted and treated, um, whether they were inconclusive or not, they are getting um, formal follow-up with our rheumatology and our cardiology division for sequential um, you know, cardiac evaluation and blood tests. And then Dr. Cooper had a question, which I would ask you and also Dr. Snell at the same time, because I think it, it's actually, you know, it, it involves both of you. So he was actually suggesting to use also exercise response. Um, so I think physical activity um, when measuring basically uh, pulmonary function and cardiac function in the follow-up of these patients. Do you plan to do that? Um, so that's both to you and to Dr. Snell. For the kids, it's definitely part of the quality of life surveys, you know, um, exercise tolerance and fatigue. But uh, as far as a formal um, objective measure, I, I, don't, I don't have that information. Do you, Dr. Snell? Well, in our study, so for the pulmonary aspect, as I indicated, I guess the six minute walk test would be as close as we'd come to exercise looking at that. For the cardiac MRIs though, we are on every MRI doing a adenosine stress test with the cardiac MRI. So we, we'll get an adenosine stress test on, every, on everybody. Uh, we, but, and we have actually done um, uh, exercise, uh, exercise treadmill tests on a few people that actually had abnormal adenosine stress uh, cardiac MRI. So we have the capacity to do that. I don't, and th so those are the main things that we cardiopulmonary wise can do and are doing. 
That's a great point, though. It's more of a functional measure than a. Uh, well, I, I think it's a good suggestion, actually. So yeah. to consider. Yeah, <laughs> thank absolutely. you. I, I'd like to thank all of the speakers. Um, we're sorry that we are a few minutes uh, beyond our time, but uh, Lisa, what do you think? Five minutes break? Is it okay? Roberta says yes. So five minutes. Yes. So it will, <laughs> yes. So what we'll do is we'll just frame shift everything five minutes um, with R Roberta's permission. So we'll um, we'll pick up and start at uh, two twenty five. Um, and then um, we'll, you know, sort of eat a little bit into the question time for, uh, for the next session so that we can be sure to start the final session at four o'clock. This was a terrific session. Thank you to all the speakers. I just want oh, to say to you, Gigi. It, it's the first time I wore a tie and a coat in about six months. So. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you, Dan. Thank you all. Thank you. Excellent.